Well, I uh, kicked off a, a series last week, and I didn't know it was a series till last night. Uh, and uh, it's based out of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. And here's what it says. It says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, immeasurably more. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So the uh, title for the series is Made for More. If you missed last week's introduction to it, uh, feel free to go online to our website or YouTube channel and you can kind of catch up. But here's the heart of what I believe God is stirring in me and he wants to stir in us as a body. That we have got to stop limiting what it is that he can and will do in our lives and in our church. We get so comfortable with where we're at. You know, and we have seasons where we rejoice in the past and things that he's done, but we fail to look forward and keep believing that there's more that he wants to do. And I made this statement last week, and it's, I've really been mulling it around this week, but it's just the simple statement that when our memories are greater than our dreams, we're beginning to spiritually die. What that means is when we are so focused on what was that we're not dreaming and believing for what can be, we are spiritually in a dying state. Because there's more that God wants to do. There's more he wants to do in our life. There's more he wants to do through our life. I mean, I love when people give their hearts to the Lord. That's awesome. But that's just the start of the journey. I love it when people get baptized. That should be the first step in your journey. If you haven't been baptized, you got to get dunked. You need to do that. But again, that's just the start. God wants to do so much more, and it is a journey. It is an adventure. It is an exciting day-by-day -day journey, if we allow it to be, of walking out being led by God's Spirit. And that's what he wants to do. He wants there to be more of his spirit, more of the fruit of what he's doing in this earth, being reflected in and through our lives. But we've got to be in a position where we realize, okay, wait a minute. I was made for more. I was made for more than what I'm doing right now. Have you ever just had that discontentment where you're sitting somewhere? I remember when I was uh, working a, another job and youth pastoring at the same time. You know, I was giving my all at work, but it just didn't, it didn't satisfy me. I just kept thinking of all the other stuff that I was supposed to be doing for God. And back and forth and back and forth. And finally I was just like, oh, maybe my spiritual discontentment is God speaking to me that it's time for a shift. <laughs> that there's more he wants to do. And it's not that what he was doing was bad or wrong or anything like that. But there was more. My spirit was stirring. My heart was longing to do something of greater purpose. And so I finally went in and quit my job. And I'm like, all right, here we go. And I'm not telling you all to quit your jobs. You listen to whatever God tells you to do. But based on what was stirring in me, I was like, this is what I'm supposed to do. And it didn't matter that I lost my insurance. It didn't matter that I lost my source of income. The most important thing was me doing what God was calling me to do. And we've got to get to that place where our hearts are just stirred. Where we're like, God, I want the more. Here's what it says in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. Jesus replied, because you have so little faith. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. He's literally saying, okay, you got little faith, but... It doesn't take a whole lot of faith to do incredible things for God. Faith as small as the grain of a mustard seed is enough to move a mountain. That's, that's what he's saying there. And then in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, it says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked of him. So I want to talk to you this morning about living a faith-filled life. I want to talk to you about having faith-filled prayers. If, if we truly know who God is, if we truly understand what it is that he wants to do, and if we're so connected to him that we're hearing his voice, 
then we will pray in a way with a God confidence knowing that he's going to do something awesome. But I think sometimes as soon as we start talking about faith, there's people who get a little leery. I'm not... I'm not talking about what some people would call hyper-faith or faith in your faith. I'm talking about faith in God. Faith in God's power, faith in God's ability, faith in God's plan, faith in God's word, faith in God's presence, faith in understanding that he is who he says he is, and he wants to do a work on this earth. Here's what it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 37 through 39. It says, for in just a little while... He who is coming will come and will not delay. So he's talking here about Jesus because Jesus came. He was on this earth as a man. He was crucified for our sins. He was buried. He rose from the dead and he ascended to heaven. And he's coming back again. But he hasn't come back again yet. Just throwing that out there. Because there's some people who think that he has. Trust me. He hasn't. All right. So then it goes on. So what do we do in the meantime? Verse 38, it says this. It says, uh, he will not delay and, but my righteous one will live by faith. My righteous one will live by faith. So what are we supposed to be doing in the meantime? Living our lives by faith. Every day, living our lives by faith. It doesn't say, uh, you know, on Sundays or on Wednesdays or, you know, in your five minutes. It says, no, living our life. By faith. What is faith for all these Bible quizzers? It is belief and complete trust in God. That's what it is. And actually, if you break that down, and this is kind of cool. I didn't know this until I was studying this out last night. But the Greek word for faith is pistis, if I'm saying that right. That's the same Greek word for hope. And it's the exact same Greek, no, for trust and it's the same Greek word for belief. So we are supposed to, faith is, com, is belief and complete trust in God. Belief, trust, and faith. In the Greek, it's the same word. That means they're all intertwined. And when you truly believe God and take God at his word, you will have this trust and this confidence in him and who he is. When you really know someone, that's when you either trust them or you don't trust them. <laughs> You know, some people you don't trust. Why? Because you know them. Some people you don't trust because you don't know them. But the ones you trust are the people that you really, really know. You know their character. You, you know their heart. You know their motive. Well, it's the same way we will not truly have faith in God if we don't know him. If we don't spend time in his presence if we don't spend time in his word, if we're not drawing near, it's amazing how, uh, you know, we, we can make everything about God this big religious hoopla that's missing the intimacy. I was raised in religion. I had no relationship with God. I went to church, did the things I was supposed to do. I was 21 before I actually encountered God in a real way and gave my life to him. And it wasn't until that point that I actually had faith in God. Because that's when I got to know him. That's when I began to understand his heart. And the more I know him, the more faith I have in him. In other words, the more trust and confidence I have in God and in his ability to do what he says he's going to do. So I want to look at Hebrews 11.1. 1. Here's what it says. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and it's the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now that word substance means that it's, it's a foundation, and it's a foundation that's based on the assurance of you know what's coming. When you really know God, you have this foundation where you can absolutely have complete faith and trust in who he is and what's coming. Because you know him. And that's what, so faith is the substance, which is the foundation, and then it's the evidence of things not seen. Well, what does the word evidence mean? It means you have a conviction concerning the truthfulness or the reality of something. So you know without seeing that it's true. 
You see, the world looks at it from this standpoint. If I see it, I believe it. You can tell, tell me all you want that there's a spy balloon in the air. But hey, it went right over Montana. I saw it. I believe it, right? That, that's how we think. Okay, dumb analogy, but you get, get the concept. But the way faith works is you'll never see it unless you believe it first. So faith is you believe it, and because you believe and have put your trust in God, then you see it. You actually see it before you see it. Because you know God, you know his character, you know his nature. You've learned to trust him. And if he says it'll come to pass, whether it's a day, a week, a year, 10 years, 50 years, you take him at his word. And you absolutely believe it. Here's what it says in John chapter 20, verses 29. And this is Jesus talking to Thomas. And this is just after he said, hey, why don't you stick your finger in the holes in my hand? You don't believe that this is me, that I was raised from the dead? And Jesus said, listen, because you've seen me, you have believed. That's the natural. He said, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So what Jesus is saying is, there is literally a blessing and a reward for having faith and trusting God. It blesses your life. You want to know the number one blessing of having faith in God? Peace. Because you're not depending on your own abilities, your own talents, your own anything. You're not depending on anybody else. You're 100% relying on God. And when you trust God and you take him at his nature for who he is and what he's going to do, you can just be at peace. Because it's not dependent on you anymore. You've put your faith and your trust in him. So the way that works is this. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. This is what a faith-filled reality really looks like. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. So genuine faith is you're not trying to figure it out. You're not freaking out. You're not, you know, trying to work it out yourself. You're trusting in the Lord with all of your heart. You're leaning not on your own understanding and in all of your ways. Every area of your life, from your relationships to your workplace to your family to your finances, health, all of it, you are acknowledging him and he will direct your paths. So if you want to be like we, we say so often from the stage, in the right place at the right time, doing the right things, getting the right results, you've got to have faith in God. You've got to have that, that intimacy and that connect where you're hearing his voice and you're being led by his spirit. Here's what Hebrews eleven six says. It actually says without faith, it's impossible to please God. I'm just going to read that again. In case anybody doesn't want me preaching on faith today. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, there's, there, there's a couple little nuggets in there that I want to make sure we understand. And the first one is this. To truly have faith, you must believe that he exists, that he is. But guess what? That's not good enough. <laughs> the Bible lit literally says that even, even demons believe. You can read that in James, the second chapter. Even demons believe. So obviously that's not the ticket to true, genuine faith and trust in God. It's not just believing. It's understanding the second part of that, which is he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So part of true faith is believing that God is who he says he is, and that when you choose to trust him or come near to him or engage him, there's a reward in your life. There, there's blessings for trusting God. There's blessings for getting him involved in your life. And if you don't believe that, you won't trust him. Do you understand that, that component? You will not be someone who prays and lives in faith if you don't believe that there's a reward for going into God's presence and spending time with him. If 
if he's got everything we need, then why wouldn't we go there? If you believe that he has everything you need, you will go to him. If you believe he has the answer for every circumstance in your life, you will engage him and you will go there. If you don't believe, that means you don't have faith and you won't go there. Because you don't think there's any reason to. You don't think there's a reward. You, you don't think there's a, a, a benefit or a result of engaging him. But I'm telling you, there is a reward and a blessing that comes from being in God's presence. There is a reward and good fruit in your life that comes when you engage God. Jeremiah 33.3 3 says, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things. So if you live a life of faith, you understand, wait a minute, if I call, God's going to answer. If I engage him, he's, he, he's going to talk to me. He's going to download to me what I need. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. If you're truly living by faith, you, you understand that, wait, when I seek God, I actually find him. I can get to know him and get to know his heart. Again, it's understanding that, wait a minute, there, there is a reward and a blessing for engaging God. Luke 1, there's no word from God that will ever fail. In other words, you understand that he will do what he says he's going to do. That's the reward. That's the benefit. That's the understanding. And when you put your faith and your trust in him, you get him, you get God doing in your life what he wants to do. But I think too many times we just hang out with the I know God and we don't get into the I really want to know God. I want to know him intimately. The Bible liter literally says that they'll know who the children of God are by how well we're led by his spirit. That's my paraphrase of that. So we're supposed to be led by his spirit. Well, you can't be led by his spirit if you don't know his voice. You, you can't distinguish between whether it's him or your emotions or feelings if, if you don't know his word and you don't know his voice. So we, we've got to be able to spend time with him, engaging him. And I think for too many Christians, we hang on to other people and we hang on to ourselves. And we really aren't rooted and anchored in Christ. He's not the one that we're putting our faith and our complete trust in. We're trusting other people. But if you truly understood the plans that God has for you, if you truly understood how much he loves you and how much he wants to do, why would you not engage him on a daily basis? Why would you even try and figure out your financial status by yourself? Why would you even try and figure out your relational status by yourself? Why would you even try and pick a job by yourself or figure out where you're supposed to live? or where you're? Why would you want to do any of that by yourself? When you really know him and you know his heartbeat, and you understand that, man, while we were still sinners, he loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. There's no greater love, according to the Bible, than when you lay down your life. If he loves you that much, why wouldn't you draw near? Why wouldn't you engage him in every area of your life? That's what we're called to do, is, is, is to be so faith-filled, where we are trusting God in everything and for everything. Now, I, I know you guys have the ability to live by faith. Because you crawl into your bed at night and you turn your lights off and you assume that when you wake up, the sun's going to come up. And when you get out of bed, you know, your light's going to turn back on. And when you go to have a shower, the water's going to be there. And when you get in your car, it's going to start. And when you go, you know, to work, your job's still going to be there. Like, you function that way in the natural why don't we function this way spiritually? Why don't we believe how much more God wants to do in and through us, but we're, but we're not engaging, we're not relying, we're not trusting him the way that we're supposed to. We put more confidence in all these natural things than we do in God's ability to truly do a work in our life and through our life. Man, if the Bible says that this, if the Son has set us free, we are free indeed, then why do we doubt our freedom? Why do we stay in our addictions and our bondage? Because for some reason, we're not willing to walk into his presence. Because we must not truly believe it. And the only way you're truly going to believe it is to spend more time in his presence, to get to know him more. 
And the more you know him, the more you know his heartbeat, the more you know his word, the more you begin to understand him. And then the more you'll want to be there and the more you'll see things completely different and the more you will trust him. You'll understand that his ways are higher than your ways and you want his perspective, you want his insight, you want what he has to offer. So how do we do this? Well, if natural faith just gives us confidence to go about our daily life, then I think spiritual faith or a real God type of faith should give us confidence to boldly live the Christian life that God's called us to do or called us to live. And I think if you go all the way back to the first couple of verses um, I read, the reality is your prayer life is a pretty good indicator of your faith life. That's a very good indicator. I was trying to think of, of, of how this kind of works, but I can't tell you how many times I've been like in, in groups of, of men or even like with teenagers, and you're like, okay, I want you to pray. Well, I, I, I've never prayed before. I've never prayed out loud. Okay, I just want you to pray. Just, just pray something. Okay, but I want you to pray for this person. Okay, and so they, they muster up this, God, I just pray that you would bless this person help them. And that's it, right? Now, I'm not making light of that. That's, that's a start. That's, that's them exercising a little bit of faith and saying, I don't really know how to do this. I don't really know what to say, but God, I'm going to do it. Now, you compare that to somebody who's been walking with the Lord for, say, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. I would hope that prayer looks a little different. I hope when they go to pray for that person, they're going to be praying some scripture and praying some boldness. God, I thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for this person's life. God, I believe right now that your spirit is stirring on the inside of them. And they'll be listening and God will be downloading. And they'll be quoting scripture and they'll be speaking truth and life over that person. What's the difference? The amount of faith they have in God. In other words, the amount of intimacy and connection they have with God and with his word. And it will show up in how we pray. And what we're believing for. I mean, Stefan mentioned revival. The song mentioned revival, right? Whatever your definition of it is, maybe it does look like what it looked like in the book of Acts, where thousands come, <laughs> right? I had someone send me an encouraging word about that last night. Why not? Why don't we believe for that? But yet we better be thankful for the one and, and not limit God. But why don't we step it up? Why don't we pray for more and more co co-workers and more friends and more people and a greater move of his spirit? Why wouldn't we pray for that? I, I hope that when you pray for us as a church and us, you know, as pastors, that it's not God just keep them safe and, and help our church just to just to just to exist. No, pray that we'd be making disciples, that, that every member in our body would be a functioning, healthy part of the church, that we would all be going out every day and be his hands and feet extended and looking and praying for opportunities and reaching people and start praying with that kind of faith and fervency because we believe and have faith in God that there's a greater work he wants to do than what he's already done. There's more. And I believe, again, our prayer life is a huge indicator of how much faith we truly have, how much trust and confidence we have in God. So, a couple points real quick. First of all, in case you didn't understand this, uh, faith is actually a gift. <laughs> Here's what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, For it is by grace that you've been saved, through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So God has given us the gift of the ability to believe in him for salvation. It's a gift. He gives us enough faith to believe that he is. He draws us by his spirit, and so we are given the, the gift of faith, the ability to believe in him. We didn't work it up. It's not a work of our flesh. We didn't manufacture it. We didn't do anything to earn it or deserve it. We actually don't deserve it, but that's the beauty of God. And when you know that heart, man, you want to know someone who's so full of love, right? So it's a gift. Well, let's look at Romans chapter 12, verse 3. 
It says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Rather, think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. And then he goes on and he goes through all the different gifts that he's, he's given the body here. So not only does he give us the gift of faith to believe in him and the ability to believe in salvation, he's actually given us the gift of faith to take whatever he's put in us and use it for his glory. He doesn't just give us gifts and then hope you can do something with those. He's actually given us enough faith with those gifts to believe that he's going to use what he's put in you to do something. And again, that's nothing you can work up. It's nothing you can manufacture by yourself. But if you feel a stirring in your spirit, like God's put something in there and you're supposed to do it, then do it. That's faith rising up that you understand that what's in you is supposed to be used for him and for his kingdom. So just do it. I was petrified to preach. Absolutely mortified to get up in front of people. My face would go beet red. I would stutter. It was, I couldn't wrap my brain around the concept. Why? I couldn't let go of myself. I, I think of everything about me. Is my hair out of this? Is that? Am I going to say the words wrong? You know, especially because I went to Bible college down in uh, um, Tennessee. Thank you. Thanks for remembering where I went. Uh, Cleveland, Tennessee from Canada. So I already didn't talk the language, didn't have the slang, <laughs> and I talk Canadian. So, I mean, I had all these reasons to not want to do it. But yet something inside of me, it's like, man, the, the word of God, like the scripture says, was like a burning inside of me. So I would just get up. And when I had the opportunity, I would start to speak. And as soon as I would say, okay, God, I'm willing, the faith was there to do it. I, I can't even explain to you how I even preach here. I will sit at home like last night and go, no, I don't want to change my message. No, this is too hard. I don't want to get out of bed this morning. Why? Because there's this natural like, ah, but yet there's this spiritual stirring, and I know that God's faithful, and even if I haven't done everything that I'm supposed to do good enough, I know that when I take his word and I preach it, it's going to be powerful and anointed, not because of me, but because of him. My faith and trust is in him. And I know that when his word goes out, it's not going to return void. It doesn't matter who delivers it or how eloquently or how great. It's still his word. And I just want to be a vessel. And so I have faith that what God's put inside of me, he's going to use. And you need to have faith that whatever God's put inside of you, he's going to use. He's given you that faith. You just need to exercise it. So the first thing is faith is a gift. But second is faith can actually increase. Matthew chapter 8, verse 10. This is the story where the, the, the centurion comes to, uh, to Jesus, and he, he has a paralyzed servant at home, and he's like, yeah, no, you don't even have to come to my house. Just say the word, he's going to be healed. And it, and it says this in verse 10. It says, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed, and he said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. It wasn't just normal faith. This was great faith. So he's putting adjectives to it, right? And then if you go down into verse 26 in the same chapter, you know, after this, the disciples go out on the lake and the boat, the, storm, the tempest comes, and they're freaking out, right? They think they're going to die. And Jesus says to them, why are you fearful? Oh, you of little faith. Little faith. And then he arose and rebuked the, uh, the winds and the sea, and then there was a great calm. So you got little faith, and you got great faith. And you got everything in between. What that means is we can put more trust and faith and belief in God. We can grow in our faith. We can grow in our relationship. We can grow in our understanding of his word, and we can be used to an even greater extent. We can trust him even more. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, 
who is the pioneer or the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's the perfecter of our faith. What that means is that whatever little bit we have, if we fix our eyes on Jesus, we can grow in our ability to trust and believe him for more, to do more in our lives, but more importantly, to do more through our lives. 2 Corinthians 10, 15 and 16, it says, Now that do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done by others, our hope is this, that as your faith continues to grow, this is Paul writing to the, to the believers in Corinth, as your faith continues to grow, our sphere of activity among you will greatly expand. He's literally saying what God's going to do in the realm around you is directly correlated to how much faith you have in him. So the more faith we have in God, the more he will do around us. Isn't that incredible? Verse 16, so that we can preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, for we do not want to boast about work already done in someone else's territory. I love that again. He's like, yeah, we don't want to brag about what God's done. We want to focus on what God's going to do, what God has in store. Second Corinthians, no, uh, Second Thessalonians 1, 3, and 4. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more. And the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials that you are enduring. He's literally saying, because your faith in God, you are able to handle crazy trials and hard things and persecution. Most believers in the church, they can't handle one hard thing. They think if they're fridge breaks down and their car breaks down at the same time, the enemy's attacking. Those are just natural things. God is so much bigger than all of that. We've got to fix our heart and our minds on him. And when we have faith and confidence in him and trust in him, we can go through real persecution and real hard things and we'll stand for, for truth and righteousness and God will be in the midst, and it will bring him glory and honor because people will be able to tell that our faith is not in ourselves, that it's not in our own abilities and our, our own, you know, ability to process and figure it out. It's in, it's in God's. Our faith and our hope and our trust needs to be in him. Our faith can increase, and our faith needs to be, grow needs to be growing. And then number three. We live at the level of our faith. And I say that again. Every single one of us, we live at the level of our faith. Those A's and E's look very similar on there. <laughs> James chapter 2, verse 22 says this. And this is where he's going through the whole faith, verse works, all of that. And then finally, he just says, you see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. So how much trust you have in God will be evident by how you live your life. How you live your life, that's, that's the fruit of your faith and your trust in God. How you handle situations when they pop up. How you handle people. How you handle, fine, all of that. We live at the level of our faith. And the reality is, you get to determine the level of faith that you want to operate in. You get to determine how much you're going to trust God. You get to determine which areas of your life you're going to submit to him. You get to determine the level of faith that you're going to operate in. Here's what it says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. It says we have this hope, which is the same word as faith, as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure, it enters the inner sanctuary beyond the curtain. So my question for you today then is, do you have this, this faith in Christ that is absolutely rock solid, anchored and secure? Or do you have faith in yourself? Faith in your own abilities, faith in your own possessions, Faith in your ability to, to work and to, to make money. Faith in your charisma to be able to do whatever. Or are you anchored 
to God. What's your anchor? Because if this is your anchor, if you are anchored to Christ, then you will have faith in the midst of any circumstance because you won't be moved by circumstances. Why? Because that's, that's what true faith is. You're not looking at the natural. You're seeing the future before it's there because you're listening to God's voice. You're being led by his spirit. So if God said, I want you to walk into that sea, you'd start walking in before it ever parted. And as you stepped in, you would see it part. That's what it means to truly have faith in God. But again, you're only going to live at the level of your faith. So if you don't like the circumstances in your life, then I think it's time to, to draw near. I think it's time to pull a little closer to God. Spend a little more time meditating in his word, asking for his wisdom and his input and his insight in whatever area that you need it. And as you do that, you will receive the reward, which is knowing his heart, which means you'll trust him more, knowing his plan, which means you'll know what to do, but that only comes from his presence. Romans 10, 17, how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You don't pray for faith. You don't. You're given faith, and then you pray to know God, to know his will, and to know his heart. And as you know his will, and as you know his heart, your faith will grow. Because your relationship grows. Because you know him better. So if we go all the way back to that opening scripture in Matthew 17, 20, it says, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. I believe like God's given us that much faith, but we're not grabbing a hold of it and pressing in. Man, if we would just do something with what we've been given, let alone understand that that if we take what's been given and we grow it, what God could do in and through our lives? I want to, uh, I want to read to you uh, a long passage. <laughs> it's, in, uh, it's in Matthew 20, but I, I want to read to you out of Mark, Mark chapter 9, and start reading in verse 14. And it says this, it says, uh, and when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law were arguing with them. And as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder, and they ran to greet him. So as normal, Jesus draws a crowd, just the way he lives, right? Just ca carrying the presence of God. It's awesome. He draws a crowd. And so Jesus asked, what are you arguing with them about? A man in the crowd answered, well, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by his spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth, and he becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. So here's this man, and he's coming to Jesus, and he's saying, Listen, my son is messed up, and he has been messed up for a long time. And I brought him to, to your disciples. And they couldn't do anything. They had nothing to offer. And what does Jesus say? He, he says, you unbelieving generation. Do you think he was talking to the crowd or do you think he was talking to the disciples? I 100% believe he was talking to the disciples. Because they didn't have enough faith to believe that they could set this demonized boy free. And it goes on. Jesus says, well, how long, how long am I going to stay with you? How long shall I put up with you guys? Verse 20, it says, so they brought him. Oh, he said, bring the boy to me. So they brought him. And when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. At which point most disciples would run. And scream and freak out. Ah! <laughs> what do I do? Ah! I don't know what to do. You know, it, it's, it's wild. 
Verse 21, Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. He's like, my situation's hopeless. I don't have an answer. It's been like since he was a little kid. He's just been demonized and suicidal, and, 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 and it's horrible. If you can do anything. And Jesus, in verse 23, says, if you can? If you can? Everything is possible for the one who believes. He's, he's literally saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You're actually asking if you can? That's like praying, God, if you can do something in this circumstance, please do it. Do you understand the, la the, the ignorance of knowing who you're talking to in that? Do you understand how many times I have been ignorant in my conversations, in prayers with God, forgetting who he is and what he's capable of doing and how I come to him and I ask and pray for things. And God, if you wouldn't mind, could you maybe like just sort of like, come on. That's not going to him with confidence, knowing him, knowing his character, knowing his nature, knowing his promises. And so it says, uh, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I really do believe. But help, help me overcome my unbelief. Like, like I really do believe. I, really what he's saying is, I want to believe. That's really what he's saying. He's saying, I want to believe, but I don't know you, so help me know you. That's how I see that. Because if you really knew him, you'd know that he had the ability to, so you wouldn't say, if you can. You would say, I know you can. So then it goes on, and it, in verse 20, it says, So when Jesus saw that a crowd was turning to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit, and he said, You dead and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And the spirit shrieked, he convulsed him violently, and came out. And the boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, He's dead. They're like, You just killed him! <laughs> what are you doing? Like, they're like, He's dead! What is happening here? But Jesus took him by the hand, and he lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. And after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? God, what's going on? How, how, how come we, we didn't have what it, what it takes to, to set this young man free? And Jesus replies in verse 20, uh, 29, he says, this kind can only come out by prayer. Some translations say prayer and fasting. Now he's not saying, okay, there's something you have to do in order to do this. He's saying you have to be so connected with God that you've put your flesh down and you are not being led by what you see in the natural, that you're being led by the Spirit of God. That you so know God in His heart that you have a God confidence that you pray with that God confidence. That's what he's saying. He's not saying, oh, it takes a lot of work to do this. No, no. He's saying, you've got to be so close to me. You've got to be so close to God that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt his character, his nature, his power, and his ability. And when you know that, it'll change the way you live. And most importantly, it'll change the way you pray, and it'll change the way you deal with people. Because you'll understand that it's not, it's not about you. I have no problem praying for people, for healings, for miracles, because the result isn't up to me. I pray in faith and I trust God and I take him at his word. And the, re the end result is God's. And I'm not rocked if I don't see what I want to see or what I think I should see. I prayed for people and they were instantaneously healed. I remember one guy with his back, unbelievable what God did. In a second, he heard the crack and he was healed. I prayed for people and felt nothing. And then a week later, they're like, hey, I don't have that pain anymore. Or, or this has changed. I prayed for people never heard anything. 
my faith isn't in my faith. My faith is in God and in his power and his ability. And I want to be led by his spirit. And I'm not just going to be flipping and trying to do anything, everything, everywhere. I, I want to be in the right place at the right time, being led by his spirit. And when he asked me to rise up and offer him to people, I want to be ready. I want to be ready to pray a powerful prayer of faith and trust God. And I'm not worried about the outcome as far as me goes. Because it's not about me. It's not my faith. It's God. And my faith is in Him. I believe that He is able to do exceedingly abundantly, far beyond what we could ever ask, think, or imagine. But it's according to His power that we let work in our lives. And the way that happens is we draw into his presence and we draw near. Let's stand up in this place. Here's what I want to do this morning. I want to give you guys the opportunity to start exercising that faith. Right now I want you to either think of somebody that you know, family member, friend, that either doesn't know the Lord and needs salvation or somebody that needs a touch from God. And once you have somebody in your mind or in your thoughts, I want you to raise your hand right where you're at. Okay? So here's what we're going to do. You can put your hands down. Carla's going to start singing this song. I'm going to pray first, but then I want you to begin to exercise and grow your faith. To start saying, God, I believe that you can do the impossible. God, I believe that you can draw, you can save, you can heal, you can restore, you can provide, you can mend relationships. And I want you to start praying in faith, believing that God is going to move. God, I thank you for your people. God, I thank you that you've put your spirit on the inside of them. God, you've given us the faith to believe for salvation. God, you've given us the faith to take the gifts and stuff that you've put inside of us and to use them for your glory. Now, God, I pray that as a body we would begin to grow our faith, that we began to so know you and your heart that it would show up in our prayer life. In the name of Jesus, that we would start standing in the gap, God. That you would be able to use us to do incredible things in people's lives. So, Father, as your people pray right now, God, we just unite our faith and our hearts together, believing, God, that with you all things are possible. In the name of Jesus. So take a minute or two and just start praying. God, I just thank you for your faithfulness. God, I believe that when we pray in accordance with your will, God, that what we pray will come to pass. So, Father, we just unite our faith in this place. And, God, we believe that you are moving right now in the spirit realm. God, that you are touching and you are changing hearts and lives. God, that you are providing in the name of Jesus. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that as we leave this place, that we would truly begin to live a daily life of faith. God, where we are leaning on you, where we are knowing your very heartbeat, where we are listening to your voice and being led by your spirit every step of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're in this place and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, come and talk to one of us. Or if you need prayer for anything, I challenge you, pray about it. Engage God. It's the same spirit on the inside of you as it is any of us. So have an awesome day serving the Lord.